Thanks, Reed. And good morning, and thank you guys for joining me so early in the morning. And we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about peritoneal dialysis today. OK, so I'm going to give a very brief review of the basic physiology of peritoneal dialysis. And then I'm going to um, describe some of the peritoneal dialysis modalities that we have available here and focus a little bit about criteria for patient selection for peritoneal dialysis and for different dialysis modalities. And then finally, if we have time remaining, I'm going to try to go over some of the common problems that you might encounter in peritoneal dialysis and how to troubleshoot them. OK, so hopefully everybody has their coffee and we'll get started. OK, so a few uh, important questions just to sort of test your knowledge. OK. So, obese patients on peritoneal dialysis have a survival advantage over lean patients on peritoneal dialysis. True or false? Can I see a show of hands for true? False? Good. So, there is survival advantage for morbidly obese patients in hemodialysis, but the same has not been shown for peritoneal dialysis. On the other hand, Lean patients have lower survival for both peritoneal and hemodialysis if they initiate the dialysis modality with their BMI less than 20. Okay. Age less than 45 conveys survival advantage in peritoneal versus hemodialysis. True or false? Any trues? Okay. False? Okay. This is actually true. There are several solid observational studies um, that seem to show that younger patients under the age of 45 may have some survival advantage. Conversely, patients over the age of 65 in most studies uh, have been found to have a little bit of a higher mortality compared to hemodialysis patients, especially for those patients that are diabetics. Okay. The number of incident peritoneal dialysis patients in the United States has increased from the 1980s to the present. True or false? I'm hearing a lot of trues. It's actually false, and this is an area that we really need to work on. So in the 1980s, there were a lot of developments that made PD a lot safer, and at that time, actually, the incidence of patients selecting peritoneal dialysis as their start modality was the highest around 15%, and since then, it's actually been slowly declining. And as of 2007, in the US, the percentage of incident patients selecting peritoneal dialysis as their start modality is slightly less than 6%. So this is a big area that we really need to work on. OK, so very briefly, goals of dialysis, removal of waste products from blood, maintain fluid equilibrium, maintain good growth and nutrition to prevent uremic symptoms and as a bridge to renal transplantation. Okay, so even though hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis mechanically are quite different in modalities, there are some common basic things that each uh, dialysis modality requires. One is some sort of medium by which to exchange waste products. And for hemodialysis, this is from blood to dialysate. For peritoneal dialysis, it's the peritoneal capillaries exchanging into your dialysate fluid. Uh, a selective semi-permeable membrane uh, that allows differential removal of solutes based on molecular weight, charge, protein bounding, solubility, and other characteristics. Okay? And finally, a way to remove waste products and to remove fluid. So in hemodialysis, you would have an access preferably an AV fistula or an AV graft. Sometimes we start with a central catheter. And in peritoneal dialysis, you have a peritoneal catheter. And most of the US nowadays use what we call the tank off catheter. OK, so this is just kind of a schematic of the same thing. OK, so in peritoneal dialysis, the semi-permeable selective membrane is the peritoneal lining of the abdominal cavity. And the surface area of that lining approximates your body surface area. And about 20% of that lining is the lining along the abdominal wall, or the parietal peritoneal membrane. And the remaining 80% is the lining that covers your viscera, or the visceral peritoneal membrane. 
and the visceral peritoneal membrane, we believe, probably contributes the most to the clearance and exchange of fluids because it has a greater surface area. And it's fed by the superior mesenteric artery and drained by your portal vein, whereas the parietal peritoneum is fed by your abdominal wall vessels and drained by the IVC. There also is some lymphatic drainage, and that actually can remove quite a bit of larger molecules, albumin, and cells from the peritoneum. In cases where you have peritonitis and you have a lot of inflammation, the lymphatic symptom system can play quite a big role in removing inflammatory markers. Okay, usually the peritoneal compartment is what we call a, um, a, a not a real space, that it's approximated together, uh, only about 100 mLs, but it can be expanded uh, up to two and a half to three liters to increase the volume of distribution for waste products. Okay, so in peritoneal dialysis, uh, there basically you have two goals. One is waste solute removal, and the other goal is fluid removal. And you have four basic mechanisms by which that's accomplished. Solute removal or clearance uh, can be done through diffusive clearance or diffusion across a concentration gradient or convective clearance. And fluid removal, or what we call ultrafiltration, uh, is accomplished by osmosis and solvent drag. Sorry, I have that wrong. Convective clearance, that should be solvent drag. Okay, so diffusion, again, is just the movement of molecules from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. And in dialysis, this is across a semi-permeable selective membrane. Okay? Uh, you also have osmosis, which plays a role in ultrafiltration, and osmosis is actually diffusion of water from a con an area of high water concentration to low water concentration, or you can think about it as water diffusing from an area of low solute concentration to high solute concentration to equilibrate the solute concentration. So when you have peritoneal dialysis, think about it maybe as just like a diagrammatically, in the peritoneal space, you would put fluid that has actually high concentration of glucose and glucose over time would diffuse into the lower concentration space. Conversely, in the blood, you have high concentration of waste products like urea, acid, potassium, and over time that would diffuse into the peritoneal space, which has low concentration of that. And you have a mechanism by which you're removing fluid because you have high concentration of glucose. Glucose is exerting an oncotic force that pulls water into the peritoneal space, and then you can dump that out of your catheter. And the net fluid removal is what we call ultrafiltration. Okay. So along with diffusive clearance, which is where waste products are diffusing across the concentration gradient, you also have something called convective clearance or solvent drag. And the mechanism by which that works is that solutes that are dissolved in the fluid that is, or water that is moving across the membrane is pulled across by that oncotic or hydrostatic pressure, okay? And the peritoneal membrane is unique because not, it, it is a selective membrane, and it has different things that uh, regulate how much of different types of solutes will move across the membrane. Um, there are different types of what we call pores. One of those is something called trans ultracellular pores or aquaporins. And what they do is they differentially allow movement of water uh, while blocking the movement of solutes like sodium. So early on in your dwell, when you have the fluid in the peritoneum, uh, you're going to have a preferential movement of water from or fluid from your capillary space or your blood compartment into the peritoneal compartment, basically from two mechanisms. One is osmosis, the oncotic draw of glucose is going to pull water into the peritoneum. Uh, the second mechanism is that <clears throat> um, you have um, aquaporins, which are preferentially allowing water to diffuse into the, to move into the peritoneal space. Okay? So, and at the same time, you've got diffusion of glucose back into 
your capillary space or reabsorption of your gradient. So as time goes on, you're losing your oncotic force uh, because you're losing your uh, glucose gradient. <clears throat> so the relative rate at which those processes are occurring um, and when those processes cross over um, determines the qualities of the individual peritoneal membrane, or what we call the transport qualities of the peritoneal membrane. <clears throat> okay, so for peritoneal dialysis, we use hypertonic glucose-based solutions as our oncotic mechanism to pull fluid and to accomplish um, clearance. And um, these are some of our standard solutions. And the first three are dextrose or glucose-based. And then the last one is something called iquidextrin, which is actually a starch molecule. And it works rather than by oncotic force, by, uh, sorry, by osmotic force, it works with, through oncotic force. So some of the things to note about the peritoneal solution is the osmolality is much higher compared to serum osmolality, and that's where you get your oncotic force, sorry, osmotic force, sorry. Also, the pH is lower, so it's more acidic than your um, blood. And um, uh, we use a buffer, lactate as a buffer, rather than um, bicarbonate, uh, which was used in earlier solutions. And the reason for that is because during the sterilization process, when you had bicarbonate would precipitate with the calcium. And so they switch over to lactate, and that problem has gone away. OK. so. You can determine a patient's per individual peritoneal membrane exchange characteristic by doing a peritoneal equilibrium test. And the way that's accomplished is that fluid is placed into the peritoneum and the concentration of glucose, creatinine, and urea are measured at time zero in the blood and in the peritoneum. And as time goes by, we measure the change in the concentration in the blood and in the peritoneal fluid. <clears throat> and then you can characterize it the patient as either a high transporter, a low transporter, or an average transporter, or somewhere in between that. <clears throat> the main things that we look at during the peritoneal equilibrium testing is the D to D naught ratio, which is the concentration of glucose at any given time compared to the concentration of glucose at the initial time. And that tells you how quickly the patient is reabsorbing the glucose, and in, in effect, <clears throat> Uh, losing their concentration gradient or their osmotic draw. Uh, the second thing that we look at is the D to P ratio, which is the dialysate to the plasma ratio, and we can look at different things. One, uh, one thing we look at is urea, another is creatinine. Um, and somebody who has uh, high transporter characteristics um, usually have equilibrated about 80% of the creatinine that's in their blood into the peritoneum at around four hours. Um, if low transporter, we define that as less than 50% equilibration of creatinine at four hours. Okay. And the D to P ratio gives us an idea um, of how long it takes for patients to equilibrate waste products uh, from the capillary or blood space uh, into the peritoneal space. So people who are low transporters require a longer dwell period for waste products to adequately diffuse to be cleared away. Okay, okay so the type of peritoneal membrane characteristic uh, is going to play a large role in determining what type of peritoneal modality that you select. So if a patient is a rapid transporter, in effect they have what we call a leaky membrane. They lose their concentration gradient quickly, but they quickly equilibrate the smaller molecules. And the middle molecules, if you have a, a fair dwell about four hours, they can equilibrate most of their middle molecules. So those patients tend to do well on peritoneal dialysis modalities that have short dwell periods because they don't need that long to equilibrate. And if you give them a long dwell period, then they lose their oncotic draw force and they start to reabsorb glucose and reabsorb the fluid that had diffused into the peritoneal space and they can swell up and have fluid overload. So in those cases, short um, rapid exchanges with a higher number of exchanges is a good modality. And 
When we're talking about peritoneal dialysis modalities, you can split them into the automated modalities or manual modalities. And the main automated types um, use a cycler, which does most of the exchanges um, programmed in either at nighttime or sometime during the day when they have a long period that they're not working. Um, so NIPD or nightly intermittent peritoneal dialysis is one of the automated <clears throat> modalities and it works very well for rapid transporters who require short frequent exchanges but don't do well with a long period of fluid dwelling in the abdomen. CCPD or continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, <clears throat> the same patients who are rapid transporters can do well on CCPD because they are they um, need to have shorter dwells so that they don't swell but those patients also may need more clearance than what they can get from nightly intermittent peritoneal dialysis maybe they're a bigger patient or they don't have as long a period of night that they can stay on the machine and so they can't do as many exchanges and so the CCPD they have rapid um, nighttime exchanges, and then on top of that, they come off of the machine with some fluid in the abdomen, and that stays there for a longer dwell, which gives them um, an exchange where they can clear uh, some more of the middle and larger molecules. So patients who are rapid transporters, or maybe rapid average transporters, would do well in CCPD, or a large patient that needs some rapid or short dwells and some long dwells would do well on CCPD. <clears throat> Um, low average or low transporters who require a longer dwell to equilibrate waste products tend to do better on CAPD. Okay. And you can mix and match the different mechanisms. So again, nightly intermittent PD, think about a rapid transporter, somebody who still has some residual renal function because your overall prescription probably is not going to provide as much clearance as you would have with a continuous modality where you always have fluid in the abdomen. Um, it works well for somebody who needs to be in a supine position so they don't have high intra-abdominal pressures or somebody who's starting uh, dialysis soon after a catheter is placed so that there's less chance of leak. Continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, again, good for rapid um, or low, ra um, low rapid transporters who don't have residual renal function and need more clearance than somebody who has some residual renal function. Uh, average transporters may do well also on CCPD if they're not able to do CAPD and they want to do the predominant part of their dialysis at night. A child who typically has rapid peritoneal exchange characteristics can do well on cy cycling um, PD. Uh, and also in some cases, if you have somebody who's older small muscle mass, they're unable to an manage their own dialysis, they may do better on an automated uh, technique that somebody else could manage for them. <clears throat> Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, again, think about your low transporter or average transporter, um, somebody who is a mobile patient and is able to manage bags that need to be lifted and <clears throat> shifted around. Okay. So aside from transport characteristics, what other things do we have to consider when we're <coughs> selecting patients for peritoneal dialysis and different peritoneal dialysis modalities? There are a, a few, it, peritoneal dialysis is actually a very flexible modality, but there are a few uh, contraindications to peritoneal dialysis. So if your patient has some reason for respiratory compromise and they can't tolerate increased intra-abdominal pressures, Maybe they have myopathy or muscular dystrophy, or if they have a leak, a continuum between the peritoneal and the pleural space that can't be repaired, or if they have an active inflammatory or infectious process going on in the abdomen, or if they have a deficit of their abdominal wall muscle, fluid will leak out of there. And unless that can be repaired, those would be contraindications to peritoneal dialysis. There are some cases that are a little bit borderline. If you have somebody that has an inguinal hernia and they don't need a lot of dialysis, they might still be a candidate to have nightly intermittent peritoneal dialysis in a supine position. So sometimes just having a deficit doesn't necessarily totally rule them out. So it is important to refer them to the surgeon and have them assess that, have them assess if they can be repaired. <clears throat> and if not, then you should consider a hemodialysis modality. 
Okay. Um, for CAPD, which is, requires raising bags so that you have pressure to fill the belly and lowering bags, um, that usually is better suited for a patient who is mobile um, and uh, has some strength and ability to see so that they can <coughs> manage the technique. <coughs> and then other considerations, if you have a patient that you've started on a peritoneal dialysis modality and they come back and they're persisting, having symptom, uremic symptoms, poor growth, poor appetite, um, electrolyte abnormalities, uh, those are patients that you may want to think about switching to a hemodialysis modality or changing their prescription to give them more dialysis. Um, other things that we sometimes consider uh, that are not necessarily from the medical spectrum are things like compliance, the social situation, the home situation, their location. If they live in a rural area that's miles and miles away <coughs> from the nearest dialysis unit, it may be easier for that patient to have a home dialysis modality. And peritoneal dialysis compared to home hemodialysis is much less complex to manage at home. Okay. Um, and then the one other thing is if you had a, a peritoneal dialysis patient that has recurrent peritonitis, or if they have had fungal peritonitis, then those patients um, probably are not good candidates to continue with per peritoneal dialysis. Okay? I'm just gonna skip through that, I think. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about outcomes on peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis and what kind of evidence that we have out there. <clears throat> so the early studies, there were a lot of early, smaller studies um, looking at cohorts, and a lot of them had conflicting results. Some studies showed that if you did comparison of peritoneal dialysis to hemodialysis, and you look back at mortality, that CAPD did better than hemodialysis uh, for all age groups. Um, there was a study in 1998 done by Majorca through Baxter Healthcare. So some of those you may question because obviously if it's Baxter, who's a peritoneal dialysis provider, there may be some bias there. <clears throat> um, there are also some other small studies that show that hemodialysis did better than peritoneal dialysis. So there was a lot of com conflicting results in different studies. Um, there were, there have been several large studies out of the US RDS or the US renal uh, data system. And I'm just gonna, try to summarize for you um, the findings out of those. So in general, the US data shows that patients that are younger than age 45, there usually is not much difference in terms of mortality or slight benefit of peritoneal dialysis modality over hemodialysis. Um, however, patients that are older, 55 to 65 year old, and especially diabetic patients that are older, hemodialysis tends to have a survival advantage over peritoneal dialysis. Um, there are also some large studies, cohort studies, <clears throat> and database studies done in Canada um, and from the Dutch registries. And those countries actually have a much higher incident and um, prevalence of peritoneal dialysis patients, and so they have obviously more experience. And in those studies, um, they actually found that uh, for younger patients, peritoneal dialysis had showed a survival advantage. Um, and after the age of 65, that advantage sort of went away, but overall they were equivalent. All of the studies tend to be pretty consistent in showing that um, within that first two years, peritoneal dialysis overall is probably equivalent um, to hemodialysis in terms of survival, but after the first two years, the relative risk of mortality with peritoneal dialysis actually rises. <clears throat> so overall, it's a good incident modality, especially for younger patients, more mobile patients, uh, non-diabetic patients, not so good for older diabetic patients. And when they have been on peritoneal dialysis for two years or more, we should be regularly reassessing these patients because they may benefit from switching to hemodialysis. Okay, and then one thing I just want to kind of say, actually there are no large 
randomized control studies because, as you can imagine, here in the States, most patients want to select the type of dialysis they have, and so it's been, we've not been able to do randomized control head-to-head -head studies. <clears throat> okay, so this um, is a graph from the USRDS from 2008 showing incident um, dialysis patients over time, and it's just showing how the, in the first and second year, if you look between, and if I have the pointer here, So the first and the second year, compared to hemodialysis, sorry, let's see if I can get this to work better. Um, the rate of mortality is about the same for hemodialysis over time but with peritoneal dialysis, the first couple of years, survival is better, but gets worse as time goes on. Okay. Um, all right, so hopefully you caught some of what I was talking about, so I'm gonna see how well, we, how well I taught you. <coughs> Okay, so which dialysis of modality of dialysis would be most suitable for each patient? Okay, so you've got a 45-year-old math professor at the university who has end-stage renal disease from diabetes and hypertension and has an EGFR <coughs> of seven milliliters per minute. Getting, sorry? Hemodialysis? I think hemodialysis would be a reasonable modality. I think peritoneal dialysis would also be a reasonable modality because it is a younger patient who's mobile and still has some renal residual renal function. And actually there have been some studies that show that um, some of the studies that showed survival advantage in peritoneal dialysis in the first one to two years may be attributable to better maintenance of renal residual function in peritoneal versus hemodialysis. And some of the studies that showed higher mortality later on might be attributable to the fact that with peritoneal dialysis compared to hemodialysis, technique survival is not good. After a certain period of time, you have a much higher percentage of patients who no longer can do the peritoneal technique, either because they've had a peritonitis, their membrane characteristics have changed, they're shifted to rapid transporter, and they're not able to maintain a fluid status or some other reason. Okay, how about a 12-year-old with posterior, no, this is not your patient population, but you might see this patient. Posterior urethral valves, had a kidney transplant, which is now failing. PD. PD. So for kids, we usually like PD because most of the time, we're just using dialysis as a bridge to transplantation. And what they have shown in a lot of studies is that um, mortality is, uh, a little bit more in hemodialysis for young patients. Um, and young patients also tend to have more rapid transport characteristics, but they tend to do well on the automated peritoneal dialysis modalities, and they maintain their renal function, their residual renal function better. And that actually can be quite important when you have an adolescent who doesn't comply very well to fluid and salt restrictions. Not that that's isolated to adolescents. Okay, so. I picked CAPD, but I think PD would also be, um, hemodialysis would also be reasonable, or home hemodialysis, okay? CCPD, this is a good modality because the parents can manage it at nighttime, leave the patient with a fill, they can go to school, parents can go to work. So it's very flexible in terms of timing. You've got a 74-year-old rural farmer who has renal failure, from Posse Immune GN, just got out of the hospital. He is still pretty independent. He drives a 1973 Chevy, and he still makes a little bit of urine. What modality would you pick for him? HD? So I think medically you could say because he's an older patient, he might 
might have better survival on hemodialysis. But I think sometimes, even though medically you might say that has a better indication, some of the things to sort of consider are that he's a very independent patient. If he goes to hemodialysis, he's tied to the dialysis unit. He might be 70 or miles away from the nearest hemodialysis unit because he lives in rural, I don't know, Edgecombe somewhere. <laughs> I don't know North Carolina that well. Um, so, um, so this is a patient that I would discuss with them. You know, we also try to factor in patient choice, how they want to maintain their lifestyle. If he's still fairly independent and mobile, he's able to drive a pickup truck, he could technically probably do the modality of peritoneal dialysis. And you could do peritoneal dialysis for a couple of years and then reassess and see if maybe at that point he should switch to hemo once he's lost his residual renal function. Okay? But I don't think hemodialysis is necessarily a wrong answer either. It sort of depends. Okay. What about a, you've got a young college student, muscular, six foot three, former football player who has kidney failure now from IgA nephropathy. Pick a home modality, home hemo if he can do home hemo. CAPD, I'm sorry? Transplant. Transplant, <laughs> yes. Transplant would probably be the best choice, but he's 28, so he's going to have like a two to three year waiting period, and he doesn't have anybody that wants to donate him a kidney. So in the meantime, he, he needs a little bit of dialysis. Um, CCPD might work with a, you know, added long exchanges so that he has extra dialysis because he's a big gentleman. And so if you're going to pick any PD modality, you need to make sure that he has a big prescription. Okay. And of course, I'm biasing towards peritoneal dialysis since I'm talking about peritoneal dialysis, so you can't guess wrong necessarily. Okay. You have a 42-year-old, has no kidneys because of a history of renal cell carcinoma. They were taken out. She's a smoker, and she has severe peripheral vascular disease. Louder. Which well, probably is not a good candidate for hemodialysis because vascular access might not work in her, and she might not have very good vascular access. She's a younger patient. She could probably do <coughs> peritoneal dialysis. But she has no renal, residual renal function, so you don't want to pick just an intermediate, intermittent modality. You want to make sure that she's on a continuous modality or has some extra exchanges. Okay. Um, how about this patient? 65-year-old, morbidly obese female with end-stage renal disease from diabetes. Yes. Hemo would be better for this patient. And there actually are some large studies, both in the U.S. and in Australia. Um, uh, we, we talked about it, but it shows that, you know, with hemodialysis, there's actually some protective effect of ob obese BMI, whereas in peritoneal dialysis, we don't see that. Okay. So there's many different types of patients that could benefit from peritoneal dialysis, um, depending on the individual patient needs and the patient's transport characteristics. And actually, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but I did just want to point out, as Dr. Bartruin said, any patient you should first say, see if the patient wants a transplant, is appropriate for a transplant, can get a transplant. And if they also need something to bridge them at the same time, the first thing I would want to assess is, can they do a home modality, either peritoneal or hemodialysis, home hemo? And if they're able to perform it on their own, if they're not, do they have a partner that would be able to perform the dialytic modality for them, okay? So um, just to sort of summarize in terms of what data we actually have, we don't have any good randomized control trials head-to-head -head comparing peritoneal and hemodialysis. Um, and we see a lot of sort of divergent results, and the Canadian, the European trials tend to favor peritoneal dialysis and show that either better survival or equivalent survival um, until uh, after you know, two to four years, whereas some of the U.S. data shows that 
hemodialysis, especially for older and diabetic patients, has survival advantage. And part of that is probably because of different patient case mix, different level of expertise with peritoneal dialysis modalities. Um, <clears throat> Overall, all of the studies tend to show that over time, if there is any survival advantage of peritoneal dialysis, it, start, it starts to diminish over time and is probably lost after the um, second year. Although there have been some later studies looking at Canadian data where they show that in hemodialysis over the past five years, there hasn't been any improvement in the survival rates, whereas in peritoneal dialysis, there has continued to be improvement in the survival rates. And so in that study, they showed that you know, peritoneal dialysis was equivalent to hemodialysis up to four years within initiation of dialysis modality. OK, younger patients may, again, there are no head-to-head -head studies, may have a survival advantage. And it may also be dependent on um, the peritoneal dialysis team, their expertise, and their technique, older patients, survival advantage with hemodialysis. There's better preservation of residual renal function in the first couple of years, and higher technique failure in PD. Okay. All right, so I don't know how much more time we have, um, but maybe I can do a couple cases of PD troubleshooting. So you have a patient, they come in, and they say, Doc, I just want to show you something that's going on. And they pull up their shirt, and they're showing you this. And when you look, you see that there's actually something dangling out of their catheter. So that is a tank off catheter. And what you're having is erosion at the exit site. And in fact, I can, what you're seeing here is the external cuff of the catheter that is there to hold the catheter in. And it's extruded, most likely because there's some infection at the exit site. Another thing you need to consider when you see that is, this, is there a deeper infection? So you get a little closer, and now it looks like this. And there's some yellow, purulent stuff draining and tenderness over the exit site. And then you get an ultrasound, and you see there's a lucency there. And this patient has got a tunnel infection with an abscess. OK? So if you have just an exit site infection without a tunnel infection, um, that's something that you might be able to treat with oral antibiotics. If you have an exit site infection that's associated with a tunnel infection or with peritonitis, that needs to be treated with IV antibiotics. And if, you, if it's communicating, that probably needs to have that catheter taken out. Okay? So peritonitis, there's basically uh, three diagnostic criteria. You have to satisfy two out of the three signs and symptoms of peritoneal inflammation, which I listed some of those here. But especially abdominal pain that's persisting throughout the cycle, cloudy fluid, fever. Some patients just come in with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, or diarrhea, okay, bloody or cloudy fluid. Um, and then the fluid evaluation is very important because there are other causes of bloody and cloudy fluid aside from peritonitis. So you want to see that there is a um, differential favoring neutrophils, okay? And demonstration of bacteria by gram stain or culture, that does not, if, if this is negative, that does not exclude that they have peritonitis um, because in some studies, up to 30% of patients that have peritonitis are culture negative. Okay. So if you have that patient, you want to assess to see if they look septic and if they're looking septic or they're not doing well, they might need to be admitted. Um, and if they do come in, please have them, if you're the person on the phone talking to the patient, bring their drain bag, the last drain bag they had, so that even if you don't have a dialysis nurse, you can take a sample from the drain bag. Okay? And if they look sick and you haven't been able to get in touch with the nephrologist or a nephrology team member, go ahead and cover them with empiric antibiotics. Okay? And then further investigate try to get a hold of your nephrologist. So the most common organism still staph and struck, but there is a fair incidence of gram negatives, especially pseudomonas, even though I listed at the bottom. So when you do empiric coverage, you do need to cover for gram negatives and gram positive. 
sorry, gram positive and gram negative, specifically Pseudomonas. Okay. Usually, if you have a nephrologist and the fluid is looking cloudy, it means that the fluid is inflamed, and we would recommend once you have your fluid for analysis to do some rapid flushes. Addition of heparin to prevent fibrin uh, clotting because when you have inflammation, inevitably you've got fibrin and it can clot the catheter. Um, and if they're not improving over the next um, two to three days, then you need to be thinking about resistant ant organisms, um, other intra-abdominal causes, and whether or not you need to remove your peritoneal catheter. Most of the time, you can still continue with peritoneal dialysis. And in fact, if they don't have sepsis, you can probably treat them with intraperitoneal antibiotics. And you can have hematogenous seeding of the peritoneum causing peritonitis or um, infection coming in from the external site. But it's usually unusual to have peritonitis that then causes sepsis, although there have been cases. But if you have a patient that looks well, even though they have a peritonitis, we did have a case of a patient that came in and he did not look septic, but he had a recurrent fungal peritonitis, and we were not able to get the catheter out in a timely manner because there was concern that uh, he would become septic if we placed a dialysis catheter, even though he looked good. So just keep in mind, sepsis is usually from blood to the peritoneum or outside in, but it's less likely to go from the peritoneum uh, into the blood, okay? Um, so again, I think we kind of covered the antibiotic regimen. If possible, make sure you ask if they still have residual renal function because, again, that contributes a lot to their survival. And if they do, you want to try to avoid gentamicin. And also, if you, unless they have some indication, you don't really want to go with vancomycin first class because of resistant organisms. Okay. There are other causes of pain with peritoneal dialysis that are not infectious. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to ask them where, when during the cycle they have pain. If it's with infusion, it might be things that are associated with the character of the dialysate, the temperature, the pH. It may be associated with pressure as they're filling. Okay. Um, sometimes the position of the catheter can cause referred pain. You always want to think about other inflammatory intra-abdominal processes if they're not responding, and sometimes they can have things that are not infectious. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left? Okay. All right. So you get a call. You are in Hobunk Town. Nephrologist has not been available, and the patient says, Doc, I need your help. My dialysis is not working. So some of the common things that you might troubleshoot are to see, well, is this a mechanical problem? Is there a cycler malfunction? Is there a catheter malfunction? Is it a flow obstruction issue? Maybe the prescription is wrong and they've absorbed all of their fluid. Maybe they have a mechanical leak or they have ultrafiltration failure. Okay. Um, so he specifies and he says, well, I'm able to fill but, and dwell, but nothing is draining out. Okay. And you talk to the patient further, you assess him to see if this fluid building up in his abdomen. Is he having symptoms of fluid overload? Okay. You might, if he's doing CAPD, which is the manual peritoneal dialysis, you might ask where is the drain bag, because if the drain bag is too high, then they may not drain because there's no gravity pushing the fluid out, okay? If he's having symptoms of fluid overload, you may need to stop the dialysis, but if not, you can try to reposition them. You can have them try different maneuvers, walking around, turning from side to side, um, but if they do, are not feeling well and they are having symptoms, probably it would be wise to go ahead and bring them in and further evaluate them because there can be other things that are non-mechanical, okay? <coughs> catheter, common things, catheter clinks, fibrin clots, migration or malplacement of the uh, catheter tip, tip being in a peritoneal pocket, especially if they have had adhesions from previous surgery or they're constipated, okay? Omental wrapping. Okay, so uh, I kind of gave it away, but do you guys, can you guys see where the tip of the catheter is? So this is a coil catheter, and the tip is in this baby is right underneath the diaphragm, and it should be down here in the peritone uh, in the pelvis. Okay, so that 
patient had a catheter migration and it wasn't working. And again here, this is an adult, and, and if you can see the tip of the catheter has migrated up rather than facing downward. So there, sometimes there are some maneuvers you can do. You can fill the patient and have them move around again, and sometimes the catheter will float back down into position. Um, if that doesn't work, you might have to send them to IR to have that reposition. If they're still having problems, they might have to have exploration to make sure that it's not wrapped with omentum. Um, and in those cases, they can do it. Omentectomy, uh, cut away the omentum or fix the omentum. Um, if you have a PD team available, they might be able to try a little bit of TPA to make sure there's not a clot there. Okay? And this is, I just wanted to show, that's where the PD catheter tip location ought to be. Okay? So it's your manual PD system with your external cuff, and there usually is an internal cuff there too. Okay, other mechanical issues you might uh, encounter. So if they have a clot and it's inside the catheter, you might be able to TP that, TPA that, but sometimes they can develop a fibrous capsule which encloses the outside, and a lot of times you might need to change the catheter in that case because it's very difficult to get rid of that. Um, this is a patient that had some abdominal surgeries and has lots of adhesions, and this can interfere with the movement, free movement of fluid or trap the catheter in a different position. And this is a patient that had omental entrapment. It's wrapped all around the catheter, and so they had to actually exchange the catheter and do an omentectomy. Okay. Non-mechanical or non-catheter issues. Again, it could be a mechanical issue but not related to the catheter. Um, it could be related to intra-abdominal blockage of flow or pockets of fluid. Okay. Okay, so I think I'm just going to do this one last one and stop. So, or I can stop here and you guys can ask questions, maybe. Keep going? Okay. All right, so you happen to be the ED doc that night in Edgecombe County. You have a patient that comes in and they bring their bag in of PD fluid and they're like, I want you to look at this fluid and tell me what's going on. It's looking pretty bloody, and you're feeling kind of anxious, and you're thinking, what's going on with that? So I'm just going to help you out. <laughs> <laughs> it could be bad. It could be good. You know, assess your patient. How are they feeling? Have they had any trauma? Did they manipulate their catheter? What is their cause of kidney failure? Have they had a surgery or some other intervention recently? Are they febrile? You know, are they looking septic? So some of the benign causes of fluid. So the peritoneum actually is in continuum with the female with the fo follicular uh, space. So if you are menstruating, you can have blood in the peritoneal fluid, and that's benign will go away when they stop menstruating, okay? Or if they had a ruptured uh, ovarian cyst, there can be blood there. Okay, or hopefully most patients when they go into ESRD tend to lose fertility, but there are that small percentage that get pregnant and you still could have potentially ectopic pregnancies, okay? Um, static after procedures or if they've had some mechanical irritation or traction onto the catheter, sometimes you can see some blood that might go away. Um, Sometimes it may be a sign of something that's a little worse, like trauma that is actually needs to be intervened. Peritonitis, that can be a common cause of blood. Diverticulosis, rupture of diverticulosis. Rhabdomyolysis, so they can see that in the, the PD fluid. Malignancy or bleeding diathesis. And I'm sure there are other things, but there's... Okay, how about... This would be a very typical appearance for peritonitis, okay? But sometimes there can be other causes of cloudy fluid. This is, could be peritonitis also, but I would describe it more milky fluid. So a couple other things that you might want to think about. If they have no other signs of peritonitis, they didn't fit the two out of three criteria, no signs and symptoms, blood cell count is not elevated, culture is negative. 
Sometimes they can just have fibrin strands that need to be taken care of. Sometimes there's some other source of intra-abdominal inflammation. If it's looking milky, you might want to think about a chylus leak or hypertriglyceridemia. Okay. I can keep going. <laughs> um, okay, Let's, this is the last one, I think. Okay, it's in the middle of the night. You get a call from your ED doc. Um, they're not able to get a hold of the nephrologist, and they said, you're listed as the primary care doc. Uh, what, what do we need to do for this patient? He's coming in, he's a PD patient, and he's getting shorter breath with his dialysis treatments. So you're going to think about a differential, okay? Fluid overload. They can have leak, remember? Heart failure, that could be something that's aside from the peritoneal treatment. Um, or they could have fluid overload because they're not compliant with their dialysis treatment or they're having dietary or sodium indiscretion. They could have a pneumonia. Okay. So you want to further assess so that you can try to narrow that. Okay, so you end up bringing this patient in because you're not really sure. You have them do a chest x-ray. Or, sorry, I skipped a chest x-ray, sorry. You went ahead to do a CT MRI, and this is what you see. <laughs> So this is what you would see with a pleuroperitoneal leak, okay? Um, with MR scintigraphy, you're putting some contrast into the peritoneal fluid. So peritoneal fluid will have higher density appearance than the pleural fluid. And it might be difficult to see, but here you can see they're in con continu continuum. Here's the pleural fluid and the peritoneal fluid. And again, here you've got peritoneal fluid actually going up around that lung. So these patients, you need to s stop the dialysis, okay, and fix the leak. Switch them over to hemo. <laughs> um, you can do scintigraphy, and this is a lot dif more difficult to see, I think, but I guess the diaphragm is here. <coughs> and you have them standing. Uh, this is not a good image, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, it could be just volume overload. Maybe um, they're not on a good prescription or they had a recent episode of peritonitis which can sometimes change your exchange characteristics from average or low to rapid transporter. And so if you have them on CAPD and they have long dwells, they may be reabsorbing all of that fluid. Um, or maybe they need to have a higher concentration of um, dextrose in the fluid. Um, or maybe you have them on a, a setting where you're giving them a certain amount of time to fill and drain, and they take longer to drain, so they're not able to fully drain before they get their next fill. We've had that problem before, too. Um, or it could be that the volume, the fluid is tracking to an area of least resistance, and you've got some other leak, okay? Or ultrafiltration failure, which is where patients um, become very rapid transporters and you're not able really to remove fluid off with a reasonable prescription. In those cases, sometimes you can try icodextran, which is a non-dextrose-based solution that works with oncotic pressure because um, that can dwell longer and it doesn't get reabsorbed. Um, but if you're having to go that route, you also should be thinking, maybe I should be switching my modality of renal replacement. Okay. Other non um, prescription or treatment related, um, congestive heart failure, liver disease, IVC thrombus, loss of residual renal function often occurs over the first year and a half. So that could be a reason that they were doing well because they still had some residual renal function and now they've lost that. Okay. Uh, I think I'm just going to stop here. <laughs> Any questions?